very glad to be here. Uh, a rheumatologist, I'm going to start with talking about what a rheumatologist is. A rheumatologist is an internist who does uh, subspecialty training focusing on the um, rheumatic diseases, the autoimmune diseases, the diseases of uh, self-destruction. And we also deal with um, degenerative chain, uh, diseases such as osteoarthritis. One of the biggest areas of rheumatology is rheumatoid arthritis because it's such a common disease. So I probably have three or 400 um, rheumatoids in my practice, and that's just one of more than 10 rheumatologists in the city. So it's a very common disease. Maybe two, three million Americans suffer from rheumatoid arthritis. Um, when I was in my fellowship at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, we saw as a tertiary referral center the very worst um, of the, uh, the rheumatoids. But I don't think it made as big an impression upon me as when I was a resident here at UH. Uh, I had to go out to uh, uh, Unilever Home, and um, I, most of the people out there were not very sharp. And I walked into this room where this uh, woman was a pretzel. She was literally a pretzel. And because the other uh, patients um, weren't very um, sharp at times, I didn't expect much of communication. So I walk over to the room, and she starts talking to me just like you and I would talk. And it shocked me that this 30-some-year-old woman was in a care home because of rheumatoid arthritis. That's what the disease used to do to people before we could intervene more aggressively, and still would if we don't intervene aggressively. So that's one of the reasons I became a rheumatologist, because that was a very dramatic moment in my life that uh, uh, really shocked me. And when you're a medical resident, you don't get shocked very easily. It was just so offensive that that disease did that to this young woman. So I went ahead and became a rheumatologist, and. Um, have been, never regretted it. Uh, I have uh, chronic care. I have patients I've been seeing uh, for more than 25 years, and I'm spoiled every Christmas, and uh, I have always enjoyed the practice of rheumatology. Uh, rheumatic diseases are diseases that, for the most part, affect joints. The old-fashioned term rheumatism is where we got uh, the term for rheumatology. But rheumatologists take care of all those diseases that nobody else wants or the diseases that are hard to figure out. If you can't figure out a patient, you send them to the rheumatologist. And that's another nice thing about my specialty, because we get all the mysteries and we have lots of uh, fun trying to solve them. And we have to uh, keep every organ system in our uh, head, and we have to practice the art of medicine more than most. Um, because the art of medicine is uh, threatened by technology and the way things are in 2011. Rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we think, is a disease of the 16th or 17th century. When we look at uh, Egyptian mummies and other uh, records from antiquity, there is nothing like rheumatoid arthritis. There's osteoarthritis and ankylosing spondylitis, and it wasn't until maybe the 17th century that we started finding uh, literature and art that depicted people who probably had RA. So there is a theory that it started off as an infectious disease that incorporated into our genetic material, and uh, such as maybe it was the HIV of the 16th century or the 17th century, and probably has that kind of a basis. That said, we cannot find a viral, uh, any viral material. We cannot uh, prove that it is started off as an infectious disorder, and it is not an infectious disease at this point where you can catch it from somebody. It has a little bit of familial trait uh, to it, but it's, there's multiple factors that result in someone developing rheumatoid arthritis. So if your mom had it or your grandmother had it, you may have a slight increased risk of getting it, uh, but not that much. That said, it's a very common disease, so more than one person in a given family often has rheumatoid arthritis. It starts usually in women of childbearing years, although children, babies, the elderly, Anybody can get rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it starts either insidiously or abruptly and is characterized by certain things that a rheumatologist thinks about when he's seeing a new patient. It's characterized by constitutional symptoms. They have two or three hours of morning stiffness. If they sit for a couple of hours watching Oprah, they stiffen up and can barely get up again. 
and they're, they have inordinate, inappropriate fatigue. And that is in contrast to the degenerative arthritis like osteoarthritis of the knee or hip, where you don't have hours of morning stiffness and you don't have an abnormal energy level. It's characterized by symmetry. It is disease of both shoulders, both wrists, both knees, not asymmetry, one shoulder, one knee, one wrist, like some of my other diseases. There are over 100 types of arthritis at this point. And there will be more by splitting as we better understand these diseases. For instance, I'm convinced that rheumatoid arthritis is three or four diseases, but we are not able to split them yet. And um, I saw a man yesterday in my office who had terrible ankles and terrible wrists, and that's it. And about one or two patients a year present like that with terrible ankles and terrible wrists, and that's it. And that's surely a different disease than the usual rheumatoid with diffuse complaints. And there's people who have lots of proximal thing, uh, problems and people who just have hands and feet problems. So I think it, we will eventually split rheumatoid arthritis, but, it, but right now it's symmetrical and constitutional symptoms. We find evidence on laboratory um, for um, inflammation, we, anemia of chronic disease, elevation of blood tests for inflammatory parameters. And on x-ray we find, after a while, characteristic erosions. Rheumatoid arthritis does not make new bone. When you've got a knobby, gnarly finger, that is not rheumatoid arthritis. That's probably osteoarthritis or some of the other ones. But rheumatoid arthritis erodes bone, does not form calcium deposits at all. So occasionally we have people with two different coexisting diseases. So uh, we see erosions on x-ray. We find the typical laboratory abnormalities. We have the typical history of two hours of morning stiffness, overwhelming fatigue, gel phenomenon, and um, one of the criteria for the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis is that this is observed for at least six weeks by a physician. Another criteria is that joint swelling is observed for at least six weeks by a physician. That is because uh, before rubella vaccinations, rubella caused an, a rheumatoid arthritis-like presentation not rarely. People would have rubella and they come in a few weeks later with, looking just like a rheumatoid but it was not a permanent disorder. It went away in a few weeks to a month. And if you don't want to start people on rheumatoid arthritis medications for um, a disease that's viral, a viral arthritis and is transient. So we made the criteria of at least six weeks to get rid of viral arthropathies and other transient arthritis syndromes that don't warrant chronic commitments. Um, so if I've seen somebody for three months and they have symmetrical inflamed joints elevation of inflammatory studies on blood testing with or without erosive disease, but they sound like a rheumatoid, then we talk about more than just symptomatic relief. But for whatever they've got, you want to immediately give them relief. You know, one of our uh, obligations is to relieve pain and suffering. And somebody comes in in pain, you need to do something. You start off with anti-inflammatories, uh, unless there's a contraindication, uh, Motrin's and Celebrex's uh, of the world. Um, you also can use judiciously corticosteroids, cortisone preparations, and in rheumatoid arthritis, cortisone is miraculous. If you start somebody with rheumatoid arthritis on cortisone preparations, they think you walk on water within 24 hours. And we don't argue with that, you know, it's part of the culture, but no. Anyway, um, it's, it's miraculous, and so if if we don't have that miraculous response, I rethink my diagnosis. Hmm, maybe I'm wrong here. Because it ought to respond amazingly. Um, people who are bedridden uh, can walk. You know? and, uh, so that's a, almost a diagnostic criteria for, the, for rheumatoid arthritis. But cortisone preparations, prednisone, medrol, those things have gotten a bad rap. So I want to clarify something real quick. There are three kinds of steroids. Steroids refer to the steroid ring in the structure of the molecule. There are male hormones that make men masculine and athletes and bodybuilders abuse, and they get the bad press for the most part. Those are steroids. There are female hormones, like including birth control pills and estrogens, and those are steroids. And there are the third family are the non-sex steroids, which is the cortisone family, which are the anti-inflammatory steroids and they don't have male or female properties, they are anti-inflammatory in nature. And those are the ones that with prolonged use cause hunger and weight gain and osteoporosis. So you try not to use them for long,
but they are dramatic and in short bursts, maybe the safest medicine I use, as long as it doesn't have to go for very long. So I have a rheumatoid, uh, I'm convinced they have rheumatoid arthritis, and um, after anti-inflammatories and maybe a little bit of prednisone so they could get ambulatory again, they're not quieting down. Then we start talking about remission-inducing medications, disease to alter, meds to alter the disease course or to arrest, stop, remit the disease. And we have a whole bunch of them now, from very mild ones for mild cases to big guns for the very bad cases. But typically, um, the most traditional American thing to do is to start with methotrexate, which some of you may have heard of. Methotrexate came out as a cancer drug. It's a lousy cancer drug. But what happened was these people with colon cancer who were given methotrexate 25 years ago, I remember because I was a fellow at the time when we were just recognizing that these colon cancer patients didn't live any longer, but their rheumatoid was gone. Their psoriatic arthritis was gone. So we found out serendipitously that uh, methotrexate was wonderful for my diseases and for many skin diseases. So uh, methotrexate is usually the first line remitted agent unless there's extenuating circumstances. And then uh, if that fails to be adequate, um, the TNF inhibitors uh, have been a miraculous uh, addition to, the ar to my armamentarium. When the TNF inhibitors first came out, I was very skeptical. The Enbrel, Remicade, Humira, all of those that you see some on television, I think. Because I don't watch television, but I understand that the commercials are there. And um, anyway, I was skeptical. Right, right. Because we rheumatologists are probably the most skeptical group of our uh, doctors. Our patients, that, and the cancer patients, are plagued with unproven remedies and, you know, this $5,000 magnetic pillow and blanket and you'll be cured and all this kind of stuff. And if it's benign and not very expensive, I don't argue. Uh, because if I can't make it go away, I don't blame them for trying other things as well, as long as it's not dangerous or inordinately expensive. But, um, so we're very skeptical about even things within our own literature. Uh, but the, the TNF inhibitors are wonderful, and they usually are the thing added to methotrexate if methotrexate alone is not adequate. So uh, the most commonly used ones are the Embrol, Humira, and Remicade. They're the first three that came out. There are a bunch of new ones, so there's probably 12 or 15 of them out there now, but uh, since I've had, I don't, so they're third line, if, if uh, the ones I use second line don't work. I have lots of other medications, but over the last five to 10 years, it's become evident that if methotrexate alone isn't enough, you can save a lot of time, a lot of suffering by going straight to a TNF inhibitor. 